Well, this fits in directly with uh, Commission on Living Standards, which is a, a long piece of work over the, the course of a year or 18 months to look at the big picture, sort of long-term trends in the UK for living standards and what we can and can't do, do about them. Uh, over the next generation going forward. As part of that work, we wanted to learn the lessons from around the world of other countries who've got some similarities to the UK to see what their experiences have been and what they've done and what we might want to copy from them and what might we might want to avoid doing. And this event really was a key international event to actually bring home some key lessons from one of the most important economies in the world. We look at the years just prior to the recession, the last six or so years before we went into recession, we'd see that tax credits and female employment accounted for nearly all of the income growth we saw in most middle income growth, nearly all of it. Now, given what we know about the future of tax credits and, and the cuts to them, and given concerns about female employment, this begs a rather major question about where future income growth is going to come from in this country for these households. High living standards for low middle income Britain must come from some mix of higher real wages, higher employment levels, or more income from the tax and benefit system. There isn't anywhere else. Female employment moved from growth to almost stagnation over more recent years, and that was in an era of fast growing spending and things like childcare. Indeed, given trends in the jobs market and reduced incentives for second earners to work, there are now concerns that female employment might actually fall rather than rise in the years ahead. And finally, on tax credits, we've seen that they were a major source of income growth in the years prior to the recession, but on this front, we're now shifting from fast forward to growth of roughly 5% a year to reverse cuts of roughly 2% year on year. I know that uh, now you are back at the uh, US Centre on Budget Policy Priorities. You were, you brave the Obama administration, um, working for the Vice President Joe Biden and President Obama. Uh, I think we're going to get from you uh, certainly a very strong sense of the US perspective what the experience has been, and I think some of the some of the broader political lessons that we might draw, because as we, we do know that some of the details are different here in the UK, but certainly some important lessons for us. So thanks, Jared. Sure. Uh, private sector remains somewhat on the mat in the US, um, and uh, in order for the monetary policy, for the low interest rates to gain traction, there needs to be a sequencing here with fiscal policy going first in order to generate the customers, the orders, the net present value positive kind of projects that would bring capital in from the sidelines. And so we're in the wrong box. We have, we have monetary pushing on growth and fiscal uh, in a contractionary mode. Look, we have arrived in, in, in the U.S. in a place, I, I believe it is temporary, I hope against hope I'm right about this, where we are unable to self-correct. We simply are unable, given the current dysfunction of our politics, to accurately diagnose our problems and prescribe solutions. What, what I think concerns me is that we've missed an opportunity to implement a new economic model in the US, and I don't think you're there yet. You haven't missed this opportunity yet. The squeeze is a function of market outcomes now, I worry about this sometimes in the UK as well as the US. The idea that somehow you can fix this squeeze factor, the stagnation that Gavin showed, um, simply through tax and transfer policy, by, by kicking up the, the, the income credits. And it will help. But if that's the solution, then what you're doing is leaving the well-being of the middle class and the poor to the largesse of Parliament or Congress. That means every year you have to go back to the well and redistribute more, and that's impossible. That's not going to happen. It won't work. You certainly don't want to go the other way. And I, I see some of that happening here with the, the, the uh, taking a part of the, of the working credits. But, you, but, but this has to be a market, uh, this is a market outcome, a problem, and it has to be fixed up on, on that side. And in order to do that, uh, we need an amply funded uh, government that recognizes market failure and invests adequately in opportunities for for low and middle class people. I'll stop there. <laughs>
But it turns out that much more important than the pace of economic growth during these years, again, I'm talking about the 80s, 90s, and first half of the 2000s, <coughs> roughly, is or was the degree to which growth trickles down, the degree to which growth reaches those at the, the bottom. Most of these rich countries do have a, a fair amount of space to still increase employment, but most of them are also now, at this point in time, even with the, the, uh, the drop in employment due to the recession, they're still at a point much higher than the Netherlands was back in the 70s. So it's unlikely that any of these countries are going to replicate the Dutch uh, jobs here in, in coming years. For most countries in most circumstances, I think the best route to success is some mix of each of these three sources of income growth. Net government transfers, that has tended, as I said, to be the entire story for these low-income households from the 10th to the 25th percentile. And incidentally, I should add, maybe not surprisingly, it's also the story below that if you want to dig into the bottom 10%. Um, for the, the modest income households, it's, it tend, has tended to be much more of a balance. And, and that suggests that maybe that's the, the route forward. There are a lot of institutions that societies can have that we often think are really, really important for promoting or constraining employment growth. Uh, in fact, I, I tend to think the institutional and policy mix within the particular country is a lot more important than uh, suggesting, for example, that you don't want to have too high wages on the low end of the distribution or, or too many restrictions on hiring and firing or too heavy payroll taxes. These things do tend to matter a little bit, but not nearly as much as the rhetoric sometimes suggests. Uh, so I'd emphasize instead things like healthy economic growth. You don't want to have too high payroll taxes. You need a moderately flexible labor market, but you don't have to go so, so far in that direction. Schooling, I think, is vital, and then maybe most importantly in the American, or, or very important in the American and British context, uh, an expansion of family-friendly policies, child care, early education, probably parental leave in the first year. So the minimum wage, since it was introduced in April 1999, we didn't have a national minimum wage before that. Since it was introduced, it's gone up by about 65%. Um, what's happened to the other indices of, of earnings we might think about? So the average wage index is at, the average earnings index is on there, which is the pink line. Uh, you can see that goes up by there. So actually, minimum wages have gone up by more than average earnings um, over this time period. So that gives you a natural explanation about what, what might be going on bottom parts of the distribution, where we saw that flattening out, plateauing out. Well, the US is a, an outlier in the advanced economy world in terms of what can happen to households on low to middle incomes in a period of economic growth. So this is over a long period of time when we've had a lot of growth in the economy. We've seen that many, many households, in fact, the majority of households in America didn't benefit from that growth to any significant degree. That hasn't happened in the UK. We're in a different situation. But there's a reason to be worried, which is in the years prior to the recession, we saw wages flatlining for your typical worker, and we also saw household incomes doing something similar. Uh, and so there was calls for concern about what might happen if we are lucky enough to get growth back in our economy sometime soon. Will we see the same pattern emerging, whereby a lot of households and on low to middle incomes in this country don't benefit, as has been the case in the US over a longer period of time? That's what we were trying to discuss today. We were trying to, if you like, learn how we can avoid the fate of middle and low and working America and actually ensure that when it comes to growth again in Britain, that all households benefit from it. The first, I think, very, very important question is, is the US everybody's future? Uh, and, uh, and I think that came out, that comes out very clearly. Uh, from the discussion um, uh, by the two uh, first two speakers. Uh, and to do that, um, the data seems to suggest that the answer is no, which is very encouraging. Because what it means is that though there are clearly general causes at work uh, which affect the, the inequality of both wages and the household incomes, uh, they don't override specific country conditions and policy. So there would seem to be uh, substantial degrees of policy freedom. The short term thing that comes out of this is having very high unemployment for a very long time is a very bad idea and that just underlies what uh, 
Jonathan and I have been trying desperately, completely unsuccessfully, um, to be telling our government. Um, uh, uh, it is stri striking to me that how rigid, rigid the government has been on this. I can't think of any other case in British history when we locked ourselves into a fiscal stance for five years. One issue nobody touches on uh, is, uh, is migration um, and whether it has any impact to the bottom. I've personally come to the view that we should have a strongly skilled biased immigration policy. Um, in this situation, I tend to believe that unskilled people are mainly going to end up working in the non-tradable sector, and we can raise the wages in the non-tradable sector pretty freely if we have some control over the size of the labour force. Um, what's happened uh, at the top 1%, uh, I think, is, is quite different. Um, it's essentially, uh, uh, um, I doesn't, in my view, have anything to do with market uh, economics. It's not been driven by the increased productivity of people in the top 1%. It's effectively uh, the fact that they have managed to capture the institutions uh, which uh, uh, um, govern pay determination for that sector and have directed an increasingly large share of the uh, value added by uh, companies and in the case of the financial sector rates appropriated by companies to themselves. So I think you need two rather different uh, solutions uh, to those two rather distinct problems. I want to get on to questions. Now I know, I know there's a lot of opinions in this room, um, but I really am looking for you know, that rising information associated with the question. Uh, if I don't hear it quite quickly, I will probably start to you know, grumble about it. So should we take a few questions? That uh, your predictions are pretty good. Is the home ownership dream dead? Is the host home ownership dream over? And I'm sorry, but my answer to that is I hope so. And I think it's absolutely ludicrous, truly ludicrous, that most young and middle aged, young, young middle aged people in Britain have been persuaded that the only safe way to accumulate wealth for their retirement is to leverage themselves up roughly 100% by a run down property, pour all their effort, time and wealth into it in the hope that somehow or other, in some magic way, it will make them rich. It's a ludicrous way of running ourselves. One of the lessons I think that I take from the American experience with housing is that it's not a great thing for rich societies to come to rely so heavily on homeownership. This has been an important part of the, the American dream, if you will, for a long time. Um, and partly that's for good reasons. Homeownership does have benefits for communities, for society. But it also, in, in the American context, has been partly a substitute for a sufficiently generous public safety net. So Americans have relied on building up assets in the form of equity in their home as a substitute for not so great pension programs and complete absence of a public sickness, paid sickness leave program, weak disability uh, insurance, and very, very porous unemployment insurance system. Uh, and as we now know, homeownership has a, a potential downside. And, and even when it doesn't collapse, it can restrict geographic mobility. If you have to sell your house in order to move somewhere to take a, a better job, then it, it, it may be a problem unless the market is really, really booming uh, in the way it was for a while, but, but, but probably won't now for the foreseeable future. My question is, in the future, can we actually have unemployment? If not, what are the social implications of not having that, uh, not having unemployment? And at what level is it likely to be at? Uh, on full employment, should we give up? Absolutely not. Um, we had the highest sustained employment rate in, as far as I can tell, recorded UK economic history through most of the 2000s. Um, and, uh, you know, um, are there, you know we, we, because of the crisis, and uh, um, I won't repeat what other speakers have said about fiscal mismanagement, which, which, I, which, which I agree, um, there's absolutely no reason why we can't return to that. Um, and uh, indeed, on the supply side, there are plenty of areas where, uh, um, where employment could increase over, over the coming years. For example, uh, Elaine mentioned the experience of the Netherlands, which was rather special, but a large part of that was the Netherlands uh, getting lots of people on, who were previously on disability benefit back into the labour force. Um, we could do that here, and indeed this government's doing quite a lot. I didn't agree with everything they're doing, but the basic principle that there are a lot more people out there who could 
both from their point of view and that of the economy society as a whole, for us to stay productive in the labour market, I think is absolutely right. Beware of the argument that cutting employee, this is to your, uh, beware of the argument that cutting regulations is a job creator. That's a very broad statement and certainly there are regulations that kill jobs. Certainly in the U.S. Uh, context though, it's been, the, any kind of inelasticity there has been way over exaggerated um, and, and interestingly, a conservative's agenda, which is always to cut regulation, just now tax at the end of the sentence because they kill jobs. You know, that, that's just the flavor of the, of, of the month. Uh, there's uh, no compelling evidence that the kinds of regulations that we're talking about, shuttering the EPA or our Environmental Protection Agency will be a big job here. That, that, no evidence to support that, some evidence to the contrary. Well, I think one of the, a number of issues came up today. First of all, employment levels. When the US actually performed a bit better during the Clinton boom of the 90s, we saw that there was a dramatic rise in employment levels in the States. And that was the one moment in their recent history where actually family incomes of the typical sort of family did well. So high employment levels came out as a massive theme today. And without them, it's not really clear where we're going to see the income growth that we want to see to benefit the families that we worry about at the Resolution Foundation. So high employment level gro growth is absolutely vital. There was an interesting discussion about the role that the tax and benefit system can play with Lane Kenworthy showing us from using evidence from around the world that if you're worried about low-income families, those towards the lower end of the spectrum, in work mostly, but actually you, the tax and benefit system has to do a lot of work if they're going to benefit in periods of growth. So there was a, a discussion about that. And more generally, there was a sort of economic discussion about why is it that productivity growth that used to seem to be more widely shared across the whole population in, time, in, in good years stopped benefiting a large chunk of the population more, more recently and there was a discussion about what it is about the modern economy and possibly the, the role of new technologies which has actually led to that productivity growth not being shared out fully across the working population. Those themes were discussed today and I think all of them are relevant to the UK.